Number 10, three fights and a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave. Like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or, you know, smile. That's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena, where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah. stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 is a a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs. Ooh, ooh. Beefy men. Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Ooh. 
In our number five spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over former President Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history, and it began on November 4, 1979, when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage by a group of militarized Iranian college students who took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The 444 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number four spot today, we have the zombie virus. I know The Walking Dead is a popular series, but none of us dream of living in that world. I mean, at least I hope not. What a literal nightmare. That is why in 2017, when the UK discovered that many of their caterpillars were falling victim to what became known as zombie virus, we all said we've had enough. Especially now that we've all gone through a pandemic. That kind of energy just needs to stay as far away from us as possible. The caterpillars were being infected with baculovirus, which stops their mold and encourages them to continue eating. Once they've eaten a bunch and they're full to the brim, the virus then tells them to head high onto a leaf, which like, if we weren't talking about a virus that's killing them, that would be like the cutest little sentence, just like high on a little leaf. Anyway, it's not cute and it's sad. Basically, once on their leaf, if a bird doesn't snatch them up, warning, this is kind of gross, their body liquefies and explodes and then the virus is spread onto the other caterpillars below. Yeah, see, let's all move on and forget it ever happened happened. The caterpillars are good, everyone's fine. In our number three spot today, we have the prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it's just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number two spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were being made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911, there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is just horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how terrible the working conditions were, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot-free. 
In our number one spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of the same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean, I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure, I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is, that's, that's, that sucks, that's gross, no one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter. Like, I'll give you two goats for my daughter, here you go, dude, which is just, that's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know. It's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid-30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it. That's it. Chetty says no. Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions but you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird, that's not normal. Come on in, me and my wife are about to, come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband, because you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives, yes. This was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it air, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed, whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on Earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton de Watt. 
Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Carton de Wart was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a six year old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941. He crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore. Then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp. Then he escaped, eluded capture for eight days, but in Unfortunately, the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet's nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The Winter War lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I I don't know what will. Number two, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like Mother Bear, not a good idea, after which she toured in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard, Saladin, and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met. But because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battle, 
girls, they would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men, you killed my men. Here's a fruit basket. Literally happened, and another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed, and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left ashore to fight. So he was like, basically, like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. Guys, please vote for a video about the Crusades because they were freaking wild and I don't understand them. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a knight and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair, they're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. 
No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically, they're already wearing kind of dresses. They're long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors and therefore relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold. He died that way. It was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, 
fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning, especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh wow what's happening, their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number 2 The Mystery Plays If you weren't busy trying to avoid the black dead then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title I have to say football because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could <laughs> you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. In our number 10 spot today we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, lobotomies still exist, but only when actually necessary. And there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings and while these seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to quote unquote cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two year old and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this she spent most of her life hidden away and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number 9 spot today we have the posthumous execution. Okay, So this is something that has actually happened more than once, but I just found out it's happened at all and I'm both slightly confused and absolutely disgusted at the idea so I needed to share one example with you guys. So there was a man named Oliver Cromwell who Wikipedia describes as quote an English general and statesman who first as a subordinate and later as commander in chief led armies of the parliament of England against King Charles the first during the English Civil War, subsequently ruling British Isles as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. So in 1658 Oliver passed away fairly suddenly and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but because he now had a power base in Parliament or the army, he had to resign just the following year which effectively ended the Protectorate. Since there was no clear leadership during this time, George Monk was able to have the long Parliament restored. He then made some slight constitutional 
constitutional adjustments so that Charles II could be invited back from exile in 1660 and actually be a king under a restored monarchy. So then on January 30th, 1661, on what was the 12th anniversary of the execution of King Charles I, Oliver's body was exhumed and executed posthumously. They killed a dead guy. I get that it's like symbolic, but it's just like a little redundant, don't we think? Anyway, his head was cut off and displayed outside of Westminster Hall until 1685. Afterwards, it had a series of different owners, which only adds to the oddity of the story. In our number eight spot today, we have Agent Orange. Agent Orange is not Cody Banks' cousin, but it was an extremely potent herbicide used from 1961 to 1971 in the Vietnam War. It was intended to cut through the canopy of thick foliage in Vietnam in order to reveal the troops underneath, but instead it proved to be extremely deadly to humans. It caused cancers, birth defects, and so many more different health issues. It's not like it was just a little bit either. 21 million gallons of it were sprayed over Vietnam, which affected hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese citizens, and it also affected the US veterans who faced exposure as well. While this is a dark part of history and it's really difficult to hear about, it's also important that we don't forget things like this. Knowing our history is so important so we don't make the same mistakes again. In our number seven spot today, we have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it really is important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during during the Red Summer were the Chicago, Washington, D.C. riots. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white-on-black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights act activist named A. Philip Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs left at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there's always more work to be done and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what has happened in our past. In our number six spot today we have King Gojian of Yu. King Gojian of Yu had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period and he was able to lead his state to victory but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through through was the war between Wu and Yu, which started when a Yu princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yu. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. The king was an extremely humble king, as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had, as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. The king's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before a battle began, and this is because their front line consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. The king was certainly not a leader who wasted any time messing around. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather, 
other girls were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, Grand Theft Witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, 
Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Starting off with some geography, we got Lake Nios. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals. Nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water there is a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 650 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence. For, for sure. Number 9, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like, yeah, oops, might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, Whew. I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem Witch Trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number 8. Unsinkable Sam On a happier note, this is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have 9 lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Arc Royale who spotted him, and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. 
1889, Nellie Bly took on a record breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero Phileas Fogg in his 80 day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number 6 The Black Museum No I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies, there's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest. Because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would take them out, either the old fashioned way, or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with. So not to mess with him. What a psycho! Number 5 Nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They used money and power to manipulate and they got their way. Number 4 Diaper Sniper All right. This one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in ye olde times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity, but I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number 3 Dyslexia for Cure Found I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10. And that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs. No girls allowed. The richest of families could have their son sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. I'm assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number 2 Do you require a bowel movement sir? Kings will be kings and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty or really just a bull, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh, 
Number 1. Dead End Job Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaning a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law, and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kinda sucks though. Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings at the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing, and because of their social status, a lot of them lived lonely lives. Number 10. Starting off strong with Animal Court. That's right. In the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were. Of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that. So they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding! Number 9. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah? Cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union that's right the tickly boo the boo boo the jiggy that yeah, yeah that's right your parents your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the middle ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trophia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never-ending rave. Initially, physicians thought folks were just stressed out, so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness, but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point, they were like, we better cut this off, and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost 
just tried everything and I fear what happens next. Like women's fashion, we just, we've done a lot of stuff. Anyways, in the middle ages, a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face. Why? No idea. Maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead, who knows. But either way, it was a big deal. So what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows, hairline, and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often, they would just have no eyelashes no eyebrows and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Noah cursed his grandson. So most people know the story of Noah and the ark and how by order of God, he built the ark to save his family and friends, but then just God destroyed the rest with a massive flood. But apparently seeing him naked was like a massive offense. So God said to Noah to go ahead and populate the earth and God made a covenant with Noah that he would never drown the earth again. As a reward, he gave Noah everything and to celebrate, Noah grew a vineyard and got drunk on the wine. So drunk that he passed out naked. Noah's son, Ham, then found him, told his brothers, and they grabbed a cloth, backed up so they wouldn't see him, and put the cloth over his naked body. But when Noah woke up, he was angry that his son, Ham, had seen him naked, so he cursed his grandson, Canaan. He said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will be his brothers. Canaan was Ham's son, who had done nothing wrong, but then he was cursed to be a slave for the rest of his life. It just made no sense. Number four, a talking donkey. Numbers 22, 28 to 30. I learned select stories growing up in the background of my religious education, but somehow this one escaped me. I didn't, didn't know about this one. The story of Balaam's donkey is often overlooked, probably because the reason it's there is a bit confusing. One day, while Balaam was riding his donkey, the angel of the Lord peered in the road, so the donkey tried to swerve. Balaam beat her back onto the path. Then the angel moved to a corner that provided no alternative route, so the donkey just like lay down. Then, and I quote, Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. Escalated very quickly. Also, he didn't even acknowledge that his donkey is now talking to him. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Pretty reasonable conversation. I like his argument. But Balaam didn't seem at all shocked that his donkey was speaking to him and wasn't even grateful for the fact that the angel was trying to kill Balaam and the donkey actually saved his life. But my question is, did the donkey continue to speak after this? Number three, a questionable marriage offer. Samuel 18, 25, 27. We all know what it's like to be in love. Heck, stories about people climbing mountains and defeating foes for their love are riddled throughout history. But when Saul told David what he had to do in order to marry his daughter, Michelle, he did not expect what the demand was going to be, but he did it anyway, because David is a good guy. Good guy David. Saul wasn't a huge fan of David, and no one really understood why, besides the fact that God really loved David, Saul was jealous, but in fact, everyone loved David, especially his daughter Michelle. His plan was to ensnare David by making him his son-in-law, and David, being a good guy, good guy David, accepted though he had nothing to give. So Saul told his servants to tell David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Whew, that's brutal. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. He never actually planned for him to come back with all of these foreskins. But David, being good guy David, came back, counted the skins in front of him. Now Saul had all these foreskins and uh, Michelle and David got married. What did he do with them after? What do you do with that many of them? Number two, Jesus curses a fig tree. There are a lot of great lessons about humanity in the Bible for sure, but sometimes there are moments like these that, huh, you know, furrow some brows. In Mark 11, when Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king, there's a very peculiar moment where Jesus curses a fig tree. The passage goes as follows. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. We all know what it's like to be hangry, but no one told Jesus that figs aren't always in season? Later, his disciples see the tree withered away and marvel at the sign of his divinity, and Jesus uses it as a teachable moment about prayer and why you shouldn't hold grudges. And last but not least, the random appearance of women slash Adam's ribs. Okay, so when I read the creation story, one thing that really stood out to me, and I remain confused to this day, 
is that like women just kind of appeared after the story. Anyways, I'll, I'll continue. So God made man from dust off the ground and put him in the Garden of Eden. When it was time for him to have a companion, God put him to sleep and took out one of his ribs and then with this rib he made Eve. Then a whole bunch of stuff happened with the tree of life, God punished them, Adam and Eve went to have two sons, Cain and Abel, Cain killed Abel because he was jealous that God liked his offering more, therefore committing the first murder. And it, and it continues to say in Genesis 4, and I quote, then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him, so he would live forever. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. The entire time, up until this point, no one has said anything about Eve giving birth to a girl. So where the heck did Cain's wife come from? Then his son, Enoch, had a son named Lemek, who all of a sudden had not one, but two wives. Apparently, Adam and Eve did have 20 or some odd daughters, but why in the entirety of the creation story, and I read all of it, they are not mentioned. They just say they had sons and daughters, where were they? No idea. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet. Yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. 
There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six. Nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's Nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. Number five. ASOG, not to be confused with ASAP, not the same at all. My autocorrect was not, I'm like, nope, that's not the one. ASOG is a demon from Sumerian mythology who is associated with disease and destruction. The two Ds you don't want right there. Not D&D the fun ones, the D&D the bad ones. According to legend, he was born from the god Anu and the goddess Ki, but was rejected by both of them, yikes, because of his monstrous appearance. That's sad, that's pretty sad. They both rejected him because of his looks. Like, guy, you made this. What are you talking about his looks? That's half you. Asog is depicted as a large horned creature with a scaly body and sharp claws, set to bring chaos and fear wherever he goes. Yeah, definitely. Asog is often associated with the spread of illness and pestilence. Now, Sumerian mythology really did not like this one. Some versions of the myth would have Asog be defeated by the god Ninurta, who uses the power of the storm to vanquish the demon and, you know, restore order to the world, which, yay. So unless you have a storm lying around anywhere, it's gonna be a tough fight. You're probably gonna lose this one. Number four, Floros. Floros is a fun one. As far as appearances go, he's a little different. Not so much a dragon this time around, so that's great. Floros was said to have the power to cause destruction and chaos. Now, according to some accounts, he would appear as a leopard or as a man with the wings of a griffin. <laughs> Two very different descriptions, but I'll take it. I like the cheetah version a bit more. He looks so vulnerable that way. He looks like he's like naked, like he forgot a towel after he showered. I don't know. As far as demons go, not as intimidating. But as far as powers go, he packs a punch. Floros is associated with fire and is said to have the ability to control or summon it, just like that. How fun. Yeah, flame on, I guess. I'm never sleeping again. Floros is also known for his ability to reveal hidden secrets and to protect those who summon him. So if your homie's with him, you're good. Otherwise, fire and silly walks are coming your way. It's said he should only be summoned by experienced practitioners of the occult. So no amateurs allowed, just people that are OG with the occult and you're good. Number three, Incubi and Succubi. Two for the price of one. Let's go, why not? Incubi and Succubi, these supernatural creatures are from various cultures cultural and religious traditions, so. You know, pick your poison. They're often described as demons that prey on humans during sleep. So yeah, say goodbye to your eight hours. Incubi, they're male demons who visit women in their dreams, often for sexual purposes, yikes. While succubi, they're female demons who visit men in their dreams. They're the, they're the Bonnie and Clyde of confusing dreams, I guess. In some traditions, they're believed to have been the offspring of fallen angels and mortal women. The legends of incubi and succubi have actually been used to explain sleep paralysis. So I hope that didn't just ruin your day his and her demons, how cute. Number two, Baphomet. Baphomet is a deity that originated in medieval European occultism and has since been associated with various mystical practices, as are all of these. They're just used many a times in many a places. Baphomet is typically depicted as, well, you guessed, the classic winged humanoid, disgusting looking figure with a goat's head and scary horns, but here's where Baphomet 
dare I say, here's where they stand out. They're often seated on a throne with an inverted pentagram symbol. Yeah, this guy sounds a bit familiar, doesn't he? Baphomet has been associated with various occult concepts such as the union of opposites and the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment, which is, I mean, don't Google those, that's for sure. In modern times, Baphomet has been adopted by various groups and movements, including that of Satanism and the occult. This is our OG Satan right here. That's him, I guess. I say our, like I'm part of the cult. I don't know, that was weird. The earliest reference to Baphomet is a letter written by a French crusader back in 1098. So yeah, keep an eye out if you see a demon humanoid on the Iron Throne. I guess watch out for that guy, sure. And finally, number one. Leviathar, the best for last, in my opinion. The goddess of death and pain, according to Finnish mythology. We'll finish with the Finnish. There we go. She's also known as the Lady of the North, which sounds like a character from Game of Thrones, but she was a little more haunting than the naked red witch was. Yeah, a little different looking, that's for sure. And she's believed to be the daughter of the god of the underworld, so daddy issues for sure, probably. Leviathar is described as a tall woman with pale complexion, dressed in all black clothing, and she's associated with disease, plague, suffering, pain, illness, all that good stuff and is said to have given birth to nine diseases. Nine. Not two, not three, just nine diseases. Couldn't get enough of them. Just here, take them all. Why not? Leviathar was feared and respected by the ancient Finns, and offerings were made to her in times of illness or calamity. Her influence can still be seen in modern Finnish culture and folklore. Again, creating nine diseases, yeah, we're probably gonna talk about her for a few years. Like, don't, don't do that, maybe. One, fine. Maybe one to build character, but nine diseases? It's too much. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. Hit that subscribe, hit that like down below. Talk about Ouija boards. Do you have any of those? How, how's, how's it going with those? Any, any curses? Any demons? Anyone on the ceiling yet? I might get a Ouija board. I don't know. Number 10, Gucci to the socks. Mana Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is, however, difficult to place an exact number on his wealth, as this was a very long time ago, and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However, in his travels and hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold, it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vladdy did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea, because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads, so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria. 
which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number 7. Off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I don't know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the king of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades. After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. Since we're talking historical crime, let's throw it back to the 18th century for Nathan Elglin, the servant girl annihilator. Now over 130 years in the past, few official records pertaining to the victims have survived, and the same can be said for Nathan Elglin, the proven yet unproven perpetrator. In July of 1884, there were two instances of women, both African American, being stabbed in the face as they slept. They both survived, and authorities investigated a separate incidence. In 1884, an African American American woman is then struck in the head with a smoothing iron while she sleeps. She also survives. These nocturnal attacks, not fatal, were idiosyncratic in style that they must have been the beginning of a killer who would later escalate to more gruesome results. And that is the case. In 1884, they escalate again. The first one is simply an assault overnight, but literally the next day, an African American woman named Molly Smith is struck in the head with an axe. Molly Smith set a pattern for all that followed in 1885 as eight killings took place in Austin, Texas, all carried out pretty much the same way. And the axe would always be left behind, and the bare footprints of the killer, who was missing a toe on one foot, was always on the scene. Meanwhile, Elgin had been getting in trouble since 1881, inciting attacks and carrying weapons, so when the police find him attacking a woman in 1886 Masontown, Austin, they're pretty okay with the fact they had to pop one in him to get him to stop. But the officer's shot didn't kill Elgin instantly. It did leave him paralyzed and mortally wounded, and he died the next day. And a subsequent autopsy revealed that he, the bullet had gotten lodged in Elgin's spine. Sure, blah blah blah, it doesn't matter. But the doctors also noticed another detail. Elgin was missing a toe on the right foot, and just like that, they'd found their man. Catherine Knight made arrest herstory in Australia as the first woman to be given in pr life imprisonment, no parole. Why? Well, Catherine wasn't a great girlfriend. She started her long line of violent relationships with another co-worker, David Kellett. Knight met Kellett in 1973, and the pair got married the following year, when she tried to strangle him on their wedding night because he only had intercourse with her three times before he fell asleep. Then Knight was in a relationship with David Saunders and after meeting in 1986. He doesn't marry her, which means he's in for a 
treat of her insanity. She cuts his dog's throat in front of him. She knocks him unconscious with a frying pan, burns his face with an iron, stabs him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. He finally leaves her and goes into hiding, and then she meets minor John Price in 1994. They're turbulent as hell and really hit a high, and really hit a high note in 98 when the pair got in a massive argument because Price didn't want to get married. Pissed, Knight videotaped a bunch of medical kits he had apparently stolen from work and sent the video to his boss. Price was fired from the job he had for 17 years, and yet somehow the final straw is only when she stabs him in the chest in the year 2000. On February 29th of the same year, he went to the magistrate's court on the way to work and took out a restraining order against her. He told his co-workers afterwards that if he didn't show up to work the following day, it's because she had killed him. Well, that same day, that night, Kathy, after the two of them bang one out and John falls asleep, attacks John Price, and after 37 stabs, he dies. She then skills, she then skins him, hangs it from hooks around the house, and in the kitchen, police later discover baked potatoes and a pumpkin in the oven and a still warm pot with Price's head floating in it with zucchini and cabbage on the stove. Police had intervened, thankfully, before the children had gone home from school, as Price's boss had called the police when he no showed at work. In Australian first for women, Knight was sentenced to life in prison without parole at her trial in 2001. She may be known as Cannibal Kathy or Australia's Hannibal Lecter, but Knight has a good reputation in her correctional facility, affectionately nicknamed Nana for her maternal tenderness. It doesn't even feel like it could be real, but it is Nazino Island Cannibal Hell. In the summer of 1933, thousands of Moscow citizens are rounded up by police and sent to live on a small swampy island in Siberia Ob's River. They were unwilling, unknowing settlers in Stalin's new social engineering plan to relocate millions of undesirable into remote areas where they would cultivate the land and develop self-sufficient communities. Like they would undoubtedly die, but hopefully they'd build some towns first. The first 3,000 arrived by barge on Nazino Island in May of 1933. They had no tools, food, or shelter, and conditions con deteriorated quickly with snow, frost, and rain. Still, more people kept arriving. Guards patrolled to pop anyone who tried to escape, and they'd distribute rye bread flour every four to five days, which people would mix with water and then eat, or simply inhale and risk suffocating on. But the most troubling was what the many island's inhabitants resorted to when starvation really set in. A woman from the island was being transferred to another camp and was brought to stay the night at the home of Fiofila Berlin, who said in an interview the woman's calves had been cut off. When he inquired what happened, she said they did that to me on the island of death. They cooked them off and they cooked them. When asked if he ate human meat, one island prisoner told interrogators, that's not true, I only ate livers and hearts, describing the process of making skewers or picking who to take from, those already close to gone. The island, there was a guard, they were killing each other. There was a, on the island, there was a guard named Kostia Venikov, a young man, and he fell in love with a girl who had been sent there. He was courting her, protecting her, and one day he had to go away for a while, and he left her with his comrades to take care of her. But with all the people there, the comrades couldn't really do much. People caught the girl, tied her to a poplar tree and cut off pretty much everything they could. When Costilla came back, she was still alive and he tried to save her, but she'd lost too much blood. August 1933, the island's empty once more. It was evacuated just 13 weeks after the first colonialists arrived. And of the 6,700 prisoners brought there, 4,000 were missing or dead. King Opera list at number 10, Western Camel Bones. Scientific name being Camelops hesternus, meaning yesterday's camel in Latin. There's a fun fact. Now these bones first appeared in 2008 when gold miners were working in Hunter Creek, it was only 60 miles away from the Alaskan border, when all of a sudden they stumbled across these massive bones, ancient bones. The last time these bones were operating on, you know, actual limbs, was 75 to 125,000 years ago. Isn't that incredible? The remains were in such great condition because of the awful surrounding conditions. It was so cold that scientists could actually still extract DNA, which told us that 10 million years ago, roughly, Western camels split from modern day camels. Yeah, we had more camels, now we don't have many camels. Sads. The more camels, the better. Number nine, Allen Hill's meteorite. All right, this one's for all the space nerds. This next one is literally out of this world. Back in December 1984, American meteor hunters discovered this fragment in Allen Hills, Antarctica. Now this meteor was appropriately named Allen Hills 48001, which is, okay, let's right to the point. Now this rock was speculated to come from Mars. And in 1996, a scientist claimed that he discovered bacteria from the microscopic fossils on this meteorite. Now the news of course spread quickly and everybody started to lose their minds. 
you know, rightfully so, this is a while ago. Bill Clinton even chimed in. He made a speech about possible discoveries in space with aliens and sh The scientific community later said this was not the case after further studies, but never say never. Feels like we're getting closer to finding life now with James Webb. I don't know, every time I click refresh, it's like, check out this thing that's in the past. I'm like, what? Number eight, more meteorites. For this one, we'll switch it up. This time, scientists found ice in meteorite. Nice, it's always a good time. James Webb is about to hopefully show us how much water is in space, and I personally am not ready for it. Back in 1990, after the O94 meteorite was discovered in the Algerian mountains, the rock was dated back to 4.6 billion years ago. So scientists studied the meteorite with synchrotron radiation-based X-ray nanotomography, leading scientists to find evidence of tiny pores. Pores believed to have been fossilized ice crystals. That's fun, that's, again, space aliens with water. Who knows, hopefully. These pores have come from when the meteorite crossed the snow line in space. Now the snow line is a sphere around the sun. It's the exact point where ice on meteorites melts. It's pretty cool. The study was to hopefully find out where water comes from in that galaxy, and it seems that it came from a lot further than we all thought, which is comforting, I guess. Yeah, there's water in space, it's just, you know, way the fuck out there. Number seven, viruses. We're all talking about an ancient virus that's coming back now, some ancient mummified frozen virus. Sounds like we're doomed. Just over a year ago in China, scientists discovered an ancient virus. These samples came from the Tibetan Plateau, and the samples were originally collected back in 2015. Now the contents date back to around 14,400 years ago, long before Captain America went into the ice. And there's dust, gases, and of course, viruses over that long accumulated time, and glaciers just soaked it all in, right? Layer after layer, pushing history deeper into its icy core until scientists come in with a few mega drills. Now we're finding dinosaurs, we're finding bones, and also, sometimes we find 33 viruses. Yeah, 33, that's like two more than my family computer had growing up. That's a lot of viruses. Four of these viruses typically infect bacteria and the rest were novel, which means that it's never been seen before. Yeah, how neat is that? Novel viruses, just what the world needs right now. Number six, Otzi the Iceman. Discovered in September 1991, this mummy was found on the border of Austria and Italy. He's Europe's oldest known natural mummy. It's pretty amazing. He was covered in ice shortly after his death, so most of the 45-year-old man from the Copper Age was left in rather good condition. A 5,000-year-old man was found in ice. You know, you lose this round, Captain America. Again, I'm just saying. I really thought I'd put you on this list. Not this time. Before we passed in the Italian Alps, Otzi had a number of health problems, it seems, that we've now found many years later. He had arthritis, Lyme disease, and he was lactose intolerant. Thanks to science, we now know that Otzi the Iceman was sharpening his tools right before his death. So, he fought till the end. What an OG. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this. Thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the Holy Land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death 
death sentence. And the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place. You might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, Ugh. Many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey, so if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kinda left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners, so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe, as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Starting our list off at number 10. Lilith. Lilith is a female demon, and sometimes she's seen as a sex goddess, so that's neat. That's a good way to start a list off right there. She first appeared in ancient Mesopotamian and Jewish folklore. In Mesopotamian mythology, she was a winged demon who preyed on pregnant women. Yeah, not so fun after all, it seems. In Jewish tradition, Lilith was believed to be Adam's first wife before Eve, who, rumor has it, refused to submit to him and left the Garden of Eden to hook up with demons. Yeah, which is a little more of a different route than what we would have done. Instead, giving birth to monstrous offspring in, you know, the underworld. I like that version more, personally. That one feels like a Thor installment. I'd watch that in IMAX. Over time, Lilith's story became associated with other beliefs. Today, it's 
kind of funny. She's seen as a feminist icon almost in modern times. But Lilith remains a prominent figure in various forms of literature, art, and pop culture. If you ask Siri about Lilith, it's really 50-50 about what kind of story you're gonna get. Sex goddess or demon? Who knows? Number nine, Spring-Heeled Jack. <clears throat> Heading to ye olden days, medieval England, Spring-Heeled Jack was a mysterious character slash demon slash, we have no idea, superhero? Not really sure. He emerged somewhere in the 19th century in London, England. He was described as a tall, thin, and agile figure with red eyes, clawed hands, and this one might be a little bit obvious, but he also has the ability to jump over buildings. So again, pretty obvious who he is. Spring-Heeled Jack was known for attacking women, but often breathing blue flames and causing them to faint or suffer from shock. Yet more than fair with the flame thing. His identity and motives still remain unknown, with some theories suggesting that he was a supernatural being, or possibly, hear me out, an escaped convict. Yeah, you know, he escaped by leaping out of the prison with his blue fire breath. Many believe that this was the infamous Jack the Ripper, because Spring-Heeled Jack, Jack the Ripper, I guess they're similar, but they both became a popular figure in Victorian literature and folklore, inspiring numerous sightings and stories. And he might be a demon, so who knows? Number eight, Apophis. Apophis was an ancient Egyptian god associated with chaos, darkness, and destruction. So more of a demon, I would say, on the demon list. He was depicted as a serpent or a dragon and was believed to be the enemy of the sun god, Ra. Now Apophis was thought to reside in the underworld and he attempted to prevent Ra from completing his journey through the night sky. Yeah, what a nuisance, right? Hate when that happens. I'm trying to fly to work and then Apophis gets all up in my sh It's the worst. I'm like, get out of here, dude. The ancient Egyptians believed that Apophis needed to be defeated in order for the sun to rise and then fall every day. So they performed rituals and spells to protect Ra and ensure, you know, the continuation of the world. We wouldn't mind that. Apophis remains an important figure in Egyptian mythology and has been the subject of many, many artistic and literary works throughout history. Because, yeah, of course, who doesn't want to paint a demon dragon from ancient Egypt? I want to study that in school. Where was that? Number seven, Wiro. Wiro is popular in New Zealand. It's a figure in the mythology of Maori people. He's considered the god of darkness, evil, and death. Set on harming humanity. Yeah, how lovely does all those things sound? According to the Maori mythology, Wiro was one of the children of Rangiuni, the Sky Father, and Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother. He was born in the underworld and he was jealous of his brothers who lived in the world above. More than fair, it's all hot and stuffy down there. I'd want out too, fair. It was believed that Wiro could cause illness or misfortune to those who displeased him. So you better smash that thumbs up and hit subscribe, all that good stuff, you know, just to be safe. Never know. Number six, Lamashtu. Mesopotamian goddess of disease, infertility, and childbirth. Nice, real tender one, this one. She was believed to be a demon who preyed upon pregnant women only. So specific and so horrible. God, some of these are kind of cool, some of them are just all bad, like this one. Lamashtu was often depicted as a female figure with a lion's head, donkey's teeth, and wings. So a little silly, but also quite terrifying. This is what happens when donkey and dragon hook up in Shrek. You get this monster coming out. It's not so fun. When it's not animated, it's disastrous. It's a monster. Lamashtu was believed to have the ability to harm people through various means devouring them, stealing you from your home, causing you to fall ill, pretty much anything, no escaping this one. To protect against Lamashtu's influence, pregnant women were often given amulets or protective charms. Lamashtu was also associated with witchcraft and was said to have the ability to shapeshift into various animal forms, so be on the lookout for every and all of the animals. Could be demons, who knows? Oh look, it's the D-Bags day off. Camp staff, check out this jolly go lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the wartime, that must have been awesome, especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility. Maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other. Maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them. In fact, I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is not have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II. To do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for following orders. These young adults who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder, it's not that far in the past and these people most likely took lives shortly before or after. 
this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yeah, so um, I chose this photo out of trust me like thousands of equally creepy ones because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Claus in of Ernotch and the surrounding area Appenzell custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrast such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Claus that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells in various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupal meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring, and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw, and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip, however, in times of poverty and hunger, which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money, and in the 1930s, what was known as Belchel Claus, aka the Beggar Claus, began to appear on the streets. Essentially homeless Santa Clauses, but Santa looked like that. As a result, the influx of beggars in the Claus Guide resulted in heavy restrictions, and in the 1950s, the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified, but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the Children of God leader, David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a b would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose, and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926 to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929 to 45, and in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout, unbridled, through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands to death and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo from the LAPD Collective. And it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte and they were hunting 
sifting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad, James Elroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law, Tudor Scherer, hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that would probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Scherer trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone, and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety, and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzke, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes, and so of course the normal reasonable jump to make would be um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number nine spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full five seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number eight spot today, we have the specter. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the Spectre of the Newbie Church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K.F. Lord inside of the Newbie Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean, like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the reverend just making it up? In our number 7 spot today we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961, it was quite the Halloween spooky fright that year as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be less than well kept as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft called Speed Light Alpha was there monitoring the explosion and it got so close that it had its anti-radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the Three Jacksons. On August 21st, 
1934, three fearless acrobats known as the Three Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick, and Jimmy Kerrigan, all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building, which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio, and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted, and to this day, it has never been done again, which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one. I think we can just all be happy with that. Number 5. The Moss I ain't gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times, not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So have you ever wondered what they did? I did. Weird thing to think, I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom, now you're in business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that. But that's I'm a dude, so I would I wouldn't think about that. I just don't I don't, you know, I don't I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line, or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because, well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft, and thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquettes, no, no, see that's that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate, you know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claims that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. Mm, that really sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks. It's not fun. But you budget, save, and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, selling booty. It's been happening since day one and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling. If you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you look at it, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse, where she had the doors locked and the place torched, like it was a witch hunt or something. Just had them cook, just threw, just cooked them up, just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly, who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard. You wouldn't want to catch a loafer on the side of the head. That, that would hurt. I I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. 
Eesh. I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just there's less poop. Number 10, cherubims and angels. We're starting here because I don't know where the cute depiction of achingly beautiful angels came from because in the Bible, they're terrifying. Considering that every time anyone saw one, they were terrified. Which leads me to think that it must have been a very terrifying experience because they looked, well, you know. I mean, a glowing orb or person coming down from the heavens would be shocking. But consider this description from Ezekiel 1. Also, out of the midst, therefore, came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, so they had cow feet and they sparkled, and they had the hands of man under their wings on the four sides, and as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. So for some reason, we have confused the little baby angel things on church ceilings for the horrifying four-faced half-animal, half-man creature that would fly around. Apparently, the image we have of Cherubim's Day, the cute chubby face baby ones, were a copycat of the Greek and Roman depiction of Cupid, and we know cherubims are important guardians in the Bible, but when did we learn that they looked just wow? I would freak out if I saw one, personally. Number nine, I am Legion. This next one appears in Mark 5, 1 to 9. This story should be terrifying were it not for the pigs. According to the Bible, Jesus came across a man with an unclean spirit who screamed in the mountains. The man would cut himself and he would not be bound by any chains as he would tear them off him with ease. But when he saw Jesus, he ran to him begging for help. But then he condemned Jesus in a loud voice for which Jesus responded, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is a legion for we are many. Here is where it changes from creepy to confusing. The man, or the demons, begged Jesus not to send them out of the country, but into a herd of swine, pigs, that were near the mountains. So Jesus obliged, and the demons flew from the man into the pigs, and then the now demon pigs ran into the sea and drowned. And there were also 2,000 of them, which means some poor farmer lost his business for that year. Why did the demons want to stay in the country so bad and then drown themselves? Did the host need to die in order for them to be released? Or, or did they turn into dolphins? Like these are the questions we all need answered. Number eight, never tease a bald guy. Kings 2, 23-24. Teasing is wrong, making fun of people, not cool in general. But should they meet a violent death in return? No, probably not. I think we can all agree, reconciliation is better. According to this chapter in the Bible, Elisha was a wise old man who was sadly going bald. He was just walking one day, minding his own business, when a group of kids started to make fun of him. They started doing exactly what mean kids do. They started making fun of his insecurities. Also, Elisha slash Elijah just came back from doing some cool things, and he was like a well-liked guy, but he was obviously upset by such a horrid, unprovoked behavior. So he looked back at them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. What happens next? Two female bears from the forest come over and maul the rascals to death. So violent. Wh why? Just, just smack them on the hand and teach them a lesson. That's very, very harsh, and I didn't know that happened. So moral of the story, don't tease a bald guy. Number seven, Lilith versus Eve. Okay, so apparently the only time Lilith is ever alluded to in the Bible is in Isaiah 34 as the screech owl. But beyond that, there is no mention of Lilith before Eve in the creation story, at least in the King James Bible as I found. But she is called Lilith in DBT, the Darby translation. Here's what's confusing. Why does she appear so much in our lore? She actually appears as a she vampire in the legends of the Talmud as Adam's first wife, who was born from earth like him. Him, not from his rib. Then according to the medieval work of the alphabet of Ben Sirach, he recounts her story in more detail. After she was created, they immediately fell out and Lilith left Eden. Divorce. God sent three angels after her to convince her to return, but she denied them. God said that if she didn't return, a hundred of her children would die every day. She agreed to the terms, but then said that up until a boy is eight, she will have power over them, and the same thing until a girl is 20. Unless they had angels written on a talisman, then she would do them no harm. So that's very confusing. I don't know how they arrived at that arrangement. But considering Lilith is only mentioned in the Christian Bible once, 
How has she become such a prolific character in the creation story? She's depicted in multiple TV shows as a leader in the apocalypse, but so little is really known about her unless you cross things over to other texts. So fascinating and confusing. Number 6 The Nephilites, Genesis 6 1 14. Giant angel hybrids. Yeah, you heard me right. In Genesis 6, the Bible mentions that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Also, we used to live forever. What? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. So these are the children of the sons of God. Then later they are described as giants when Numbers 13, the land we explored devours those living in it and all the people we saw there are great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked like the same to them. I'm not sure what's going on here. Were the sons of God men on earth? Or was the Bible referring to angels mating with human women so they could give birth to giant babies? It's just a, it's just a whole smorgasbord of confusion. Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, the, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him, I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead, I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage. Stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye olde IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait, let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. 
Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Bonifaci VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. We can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one, witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing? with a cauldron. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believe that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then, you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. This thing would have, I would have gone to jail for sure. Starting off with S for secrets. Alrighty, so here is from the Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago, specifically the one from 1978. On the left there, all washed out and crappy old flash display style is First Lady Rosalind Carter. The guy shaking her hand, or rather just holding it and staring off camera like a waiter just went by with a tray of warm sausage rolls he wants to really get into, is John Wayne Gacy. And if you're also thinking, yo, what is up with this guy being in so many random famous photos. You're absolutely right, and it's genuinely strange how photographed and out there Gacy was. By the time this was taken, he had already killed over 20 people. Also, when he wasn't side hustling as a clown, he was super active in the government and politics, thus why wearing the S on the lapel. It was given to him by the Secret Service to indicate special security clearance. So the S literally does stand for secrets, both the US government and his own. Whose secrets are worse though, huh? Huh? Anyways, at the bottom of the handshake photo, you can see the handwritten address to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. I've heard beauty is pain, but I haven't heard beauty is the next Saw movie? Check out the beauty calibrator. Seeing pictures, you may think it's some sort of Middle Ages torture machine, or as said, literally one of those Saw movie head devices. But surprisingly not, it's another way to point out women's insecurities and find the smallest things possible to make them feel bad over. Meet the Max Factor beauty calibration machine. It is the only one in existence Thank God, and in 1932, the makeup legend Max Factor came up with this ingenious invention combining furonology, cosmetics, and insecurity gaslighting with pseudoscience analysis of a woman's physical flaws. Max Factor's beauty calibrator enabled Hollywood makeup artists to pinpoint where facial corrections needed to be made down to a literal fraction. The machine, also known in the trades as the beauty micrometer, revealed that a natural perfect face was a myth. Every single woman was imperfect and needed correction, and this machine could find it by taking precise measures. It would mark spots that needed to be fixed and then the artist, once the helmet was removed, could correct all the new insecurities with makeup that you didn't have before you put the stupid thing on. Next up is a photo that's all dramatic flair, the death card. Masseria represented an outdated mindset in the mafia world, one that could no longer be reasoned with diplomatically. The same is true of his rival, Maranzano. The ongoing tit for tat killing between the two genuinely wreaked havoc on not only the streets, but in the mafia hierarchy itself. Those resistant to change generally don't last long, and meetings of the Mafia elite tried to bring around at the end of bloodshed, but Maranzano especially consistently manipulated matters to his own advantage. In order to facilitate underworld peace, the consensus turned from diplomacy to the inevitable. One of these guys had to go. The final straw, according to the account of Nicola Gentile, was when the police informants called Messiria and said knock off the violence. Having an idealism for peace, he actually responded by disarming his men, and they were all pissed. Joe the boss, Messiria, his bodyguards, 
and Lucky Luciano all met at a seafood restaurant at 3 p.m. on April 15th of 1931. Luciano excuses himself from the card game while that they're playing to visit the bathroom. This is the signal for the hitmen. The bangs could be heard from around the block apparently as Joe was hit from behind four times in the back and one in the head. And it's born, the infamous Ace of Spades shot. It added to the cult status of this hit, but many expect that the Ace of Spades card was placed between mysterious fingers after the hit by a photographer just for the shock factor of the press. Next is a series of photos recovered before they could be lost. Holes in a window. Former LAPD reserve officer turned photographer Merrick Morton was faffing around in the LA police department when he comes across a stash of LAPD crime photos ranging in the dates of 1920s all the way to the 1970s. These were cellulose nitrate based film and the negatives were so decomposed they're deemed fire hazard. But Merrick saw enough of the few stills to know that they'd be an absolute effing gold mine. Working with Phototech and Photo Digitation Service and the US National Film Archive, the photos were given a new life. This collection is NSFW and there are hundreds. Now spruced up, the macabre photos are mostly crimes and many of them violent and depicting the bodies or surviving victims injuries. Obviously the ones you're seeing on screen as I'm talking are tamer, such as my choice, the one you're seeing now, holes in the car window. Something about it gives me a deep sense of discomfort, thus the choice. The collection contains recognizable crimes and faces too, an unusual photo of Malaya Nurmi dressed as Vampira, pictures of comedian Lenny Bruce's OD in March of 1966, and images of the Manson family arriving at their arrangement in 1970. Every photo is scary and every single has a disturbing backstory. Some captions are provided by author James Elroy in his book LAPD 53. You can win, but sometimes you still lose in the end. It's the devastated Disney's. Meet Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. There are some everyday photos of these two in their prime. Who were they? In case you couldn't tell by all the Disney crap in the background of said photos, they played somewhat of a big role. You know, writing the lyrics and music for Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast as well as a few others. Also not to mention creating The Little Shop of Horrors, which got them hired by Disney in the first place. And in this photo you see now, they had just won the Oscars for The Little Mermaid. Hooray! But why does Ashman look so unhappy? This was his life's accomplishments. It's because that night Ashman told Menken they needed to have a serious talk when they got back to New York. And when they get back a few days later, Ashman admits that he has HIV that's quickly progressed and he's going to die soon and fast. They had been songwriting partners for over a decade and were in the middle of working on Beauty and the Beast and despite the illness, Ashman completed the lyrical work and the initial work on Aladdin. On the morning of March 14, 1991, he does die from heart failure caused by his condition. At the time of his death, he only weighed 80 pounds, he'd lost his sight and could barely speak and a voice that spoke so eloquently through song was lost forever. Before he passed, however, Disney Productions scrambled to finish the film so he could see a screening of it. The film earned Ashman and Menken three 1991 Academy Award nominations for Best Song and the title song winning the award. Perhaps most amazingly, Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award for Best Motion Picture. So it looks like a photo of two men achieving their wildest dreams, but it's a record of their last normal moment together. Number five, Nano Robots. Does anyone remember the first Agent Cody Banks movie where the villain like installs these evil nano robots and ice cubes, but they're not evil, he just uses them for evil. Initially the tech was used for good, right? To help clean up oil spills for instance, but that's, that's where my mind went when I learned this. According to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, they have created cell sized robots that can navigate and detect issues in their environment. Now imagine that the environment is actually your lungs or your liver or your veins or your eyes. This gives scientists hope that a future where disease detection doesn't take months of waiting in line, just mere minutes. The aim of these nanobots is to help detect infection or disease within the body before it even shows. I'm not sure how I feel about tiny little robots floating inside me, but um, if I if I would be cool, I think I have to ask myself this question: If I'd be okay with Miss Frizzle shrinking a bus down and going through my nose, would I be okay with that? Then I might be okay with this. Uh, number four, we might meet aliens. So I know they said that the random monoliths that appeared around the world were made by artists. Convenient. Artists are essentially aliens. We're weird. We are so weird. It was 2020. We couldn't handle anything else. But in truth, meeting aliens may not be something that just happens in Doctor Who. In fact, Jamie Matthews, astrophysicist and professor at the University of British Columbia said, and I quote, by the year 2118, extraterrestrial life won't be news but historical fact. 
I recognize that some of us might not live past 100, myself included, but that statement still implies that it could happen within that time frame. The most terrifying thought about that will be how we react to them. Though by alien life, it doesn't necessarily mean humanoid alien creatures with oval heads. It will most likely mean that we will find a specific kind of anaerobic bacteria, like kind of what we might find in Venus with the phosphine and everything, if you know what I'm talking about. But according to the Pentagon report, if I'm being honest here, I'm not so worried about the aliens. I'm more worried about how we're going to react to them. Will it make us more humble, fearful, arrogant? Will this be the war of the world scenario? God, I hope not. I hope we all get along and we're just a big happy space family. Unlikely. Before we land on our top three, if you're still with us, give us a like and comment on what you're looking forward to the most. Also, if you're new to the hive, give us a subscribe. We'll love you forever. Number three, a visit to Mars. So in the next few years, we are putting boots on the moon. 2024 is gonna be a big year. It has been over 50 years since astronauts last set foot on the moon and the Artemis program is set to accomplish this. But what's more exciting is what's coming next. This trip is also a kind of test drive for life support systems that will hopefully extend the trip to months, even a year. If that goes well, then the next step is Mars. NASA's InSight mission is now on Mars and its stay has been extended in order to measure how life on Mars, such as quakes and dust devils, will affect human visitors. It's also a test for how useful solar panels will be on Mars and if it's an effective form of energy. But its journey to and from the planet is the precursor to manned missions to Mars. So depending on how the next year goes, we might be around to see some astronauts on Mars. If they don't bring Mars bars, I'm going to be really upset. That's all I'm saying. Number two, space elevators. Sounds so cool. Satellites, rocket ships, and now space elevators. Oh baby. Tokyo based Obayashi Corp has boasted that they have plans to build one by 2050. China is in the race, ambitiously trying to beat them by five years. The idea of having a space elevator is considered the holy grail of space exploration, even though it sounds like a concept straight out of Willy Wonka. It will essentially be a long cable extending from the planet's surface with electromagnetic vehicles traveling along the cable. To keep it from like crashing like a beanstalk back to Earth, it will be attached to a massive counterbalance on one end, like an asteroid. In fact, exactly like an asteroid. That's that's a straight up quote from NASA. They want to move an asteroid into place for this purpose. I don't know, I don't know, I feel like that's really ambitious. For some reason, I think NASA's plan may take a little longer, but it is in the works, folks. A mini elevator called Stars Me, devised by Japanese physicists, will simulate on a small scale what conditions on an elevator to the stars would encounter in a weightless environment, so. Who knows, who knows? Let's go. Number one. AI surpasses human intelligence. Ah, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Should we be scared? I don't know. Would Mary Shelley be shaking her book at us if she saw how far we've come and are going? From apps that anticipate our needs to robots doing TED Talks, AI is here and it ain't going anywhere. In May and June of 2016, Yale University and Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute took a poll of hundreds of industry leaders in order to answer just one question. Will AI surpass human intelligence? And if so, when? Their findings? Well, it looks like the census is that AI will be as capable, if not more, than humans in most tasks by 2060. Add another 76 years and experts think that AI will take over all human jobs. That sucks. My first job was at Wendy's. Imagine a robot serving me. They pretty much already do. The results are based on 352 experts who responded, though I'm pretty sure there is some flux in that. We've been wrong about a lot of things before. Maybe we are about this one. Off ominous. Our first killer has no name as he's never been caught. It's the monster of Florence. The monster of Florence is nameless and faceless, uncaught, and responsible for 16 graphic deaths between 1974 and 85. MO for Target was always consistent. A couple evidently engaged in what writer Douglas Preston called a national pastime in Italy, boinking in parked cars, since traditional Italians do live at home until they're married and Nona doesn't need to hear that. In 1981, crime correspondent Mario Spezzi started reporting on a death. He soon came to believe, like many, that the 
crime was just one in a series. Spetta even came up with the name Il Monstro di Ferenzi, or the Monster of Florence, because giving them a nickname is step one, I guess. The only interaction the killer ever made with police was when one of the victims escapes, only after her partner is killed because she reverses the car and slams on the gas, propelling herself backwards into a titch and catching a motorcyclist's attention, who believes he's witnessing a crash and not a current killing, and stops helping and stops to help, scaring the monster away before he performs his usual mutilations and finishes his victims. While the female victim does pass from her injuries later, the chief inspector lies to media saying that she regained consciousness before passing and told them some info in an attempt to get the killer to expose himself. On the afternoon following the statement's publication, a Red Cross emergency worker who had accompanied the police to the hospital was called by a man who claimed to be the killer and asked what the victim had said. The same emergency worker is later called again by the killer while on vacation in Rimini. The second call left the investigators baffled how the caller knew how to reach the man. There is so much to cover with this case, including the Sardinian connection theory, the multiple men who went to jail and were released for this crime, and the fact nobody's ever been caught. But I got more to talk about, so let's move on to... Maria Del Carmen at Gettin' Head. Imagine your 61 year old neighbor comes banging on your door and when you open it she's carrying a black and red leather box and asks you if she can store it at your place because it's quote, full of adult toys. Why? Her husband Jesus has disappeared and the police need to look for clues. Last thing she wanted as an elderly woman was the embarrassment of them opening that box, right? Neighbor's super chill and sweet, says sure, even though it's weird as hell, and proceeds to have the box in her house for a while before it starts to smell because the summer's gone by. Which is the last thing you want from a box of adult toys that aren't yours stored in your house by an old lady. So the neighbor finally decides to look inside and it's insta regret. Amongst the vibes and the blow up dolls was the rotting boiled head of her neighbor's husband wrapped in tin foil, which apparently sent her into a full scale panic attack. Baby girl, I do not blame you. Jesus' relatives said they were always skeptical about Maria's claim that her husband went on vacation by himself and then broke his phone by dropping it in the bathtub. They later got text messages from different numbers, but didn't believe they were coming from the missing man. Their efforts to communicate with him verbally were also all unsuccessful. Anyone who's seen Catfish once can see through that. Maria did end up in jail. This may be the scariest on the list because it was the most preventable, failing Esmond Green. What would you do if someone walked into your hospital and collapsed on the waiting room floor? Yeah, I'd help them too. We all like to think that we would, that anyone would. But apparently employees of Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn didn't share this belief. After checking into Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, New York, Esmond Green waited 24 hours for treatment. EMS workers had brought her to the center on the morning of June 18th. The hospital had said she was suffering from agitation and psychosis and was involuntary admitted after refusing medical review for her diagnosed schizophrenia. At 5.32 a.m., Esmond Green collapsed out of her chair and onto the floor convulsing. In some truly horrible camera footage, you see several patients and even nurses walk by without stopping to see what's happening. She stops moving at 6.07 a.m. Two security guards and a member of hospital medical staff can be seen on video stopping to look at Green briefly before just walking away. Close to 7 a.m., finally a nurse comes over, nudges her with her foot, then again, then checks her pulse, then the nurse calls for help. The hospital later tries to falsify medical records to make it seem as though she been without assistance for just 10 minutes. For security cameras, tell a different story, and the hospital fired six employees after their investigation. But yeah, before you ask, that lawsuit went absolutely crazy against that hospital. You can't just sleep or eat at anyone's house. My mom was sure to teach me that. People like Carl Tanzler are good reminders, since there was a body in his bed. Carl Tanzler was a radiology technologist at the hospital in Florida. In 1930, he met Elena Mill de Hoyos, who was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Tanzler became obsessed with Elena and saving her, reportedly showering her with gifts and told her that he loved her always. However, Elena made it clear she wasn't really interested. And although he wasn't actually a doctor, with her family's approval he tried out different remedies. But she dies anyway in 1931. Tanzler insists on paying for her funeral, complete with a large mausoleum. Her family consented, but they weren't aware that Tanzler alone 
would have a key to the mausoleum. He visits constantly, leaving gifts, installing a phone so he can talk to her through the wall, normal stuff. Two years later, Tansler removes Elena's body from the cemetery. He tries to preserve it by attaching her bones together with wire, placing wax soaked cloth over her skin, and sticking rags in her body to help keep its shape. He was seen purchasing women's clothing and perfumes. A young neighbor saw him dancing with what appeared to be a life-size doll through the window. And then he stopped visiting Elena's grave, too. Hmm, rumors spread that Tanzler was living with a corpse. And in 1940, those rumors reached Elena's sister, who goes there and confronts him with the whole sleeping with the disinterred body of my sister thing, and he happily shows her. Tanzler was deemed fit to stand trial after a psychiatric evaluation and charged with destroying a grave and removing a body without authorization. However, the charges are dropped because the statute of limitations expired. An insult to effing injury, poor Elena's remains. Before being laid to rest in an unmarked grave, her modified corpse is put on display at a funeral home where 6,000 people come to see it. Ugh. This guy incites pure rage in me and has from the day I first read this case. It's Xavier Dupont de Légions, the French F wit. I can't say it on here, but y'all can say it out loud for yourselves. Has a nice ring to it. Especially since this twit is a family annihilator, doing so in the name of money and ego. Xavier is on the run for killing his wife, four teens, and two dogs at their home in L'Oréal Alanti of Nantes in France before disappearing without a, tra without a trace in 2011. Xavier worked as a salesman and attempting to create several businesses over the year, all with little success, he owed money. He had been raised affluent and his wife had too and they'd spent their lives that way. The entitlement of a re the entitlement of their regal title inflated them beyond a point of living comfortably within their means, and instead they overextended, aka they were broke. There were so many signs of what was to come to. In July of 2010, Xavier emails friends writing that there might be accidents that happened to his family that he might be blamed for someday. Even if it's convincing, don't believe it. In January 2011, when his father dies, he inherits a 22 cal, and a month later, having never used one, suddenly a obtains a license for it. After another month, he begins taking the firearm to a range. He buys a silencer and as well drives hours to buy adhesives and plastic bags. Month after that, he buys cement, a shovel, and quicklime. And what gets a little confusing is between the nights of April 3rd and 5th, he picks off the family members while still going to dinners and movies with other ones. Seeing as everyone was killed execution style, would Agnes or one of the other teens not have heard something when someone else was taken? Between in the panic of Agnes's family, a weird letter everyone receives where Xavier claims to be an undercover cop, and countless visitors banging on their unanswered door, police are reportedly sent back to this property, and finally Xavier's letter tips them off, his comment to ignore the loose backyard gravel. Under it was his family and two dogs. Xavier remains missing to this day. Number 5. Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I like at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May into October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly, it was far too cold for them to even stand a chance, and it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. 
Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away and then they would bury them right just way over there great idea honestly the further the better couldn't agree more a church would house these plagued souls away from society now it sounds sad but this was the best call all things considered so no you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon and finally number one medieval punishment cleaner this one really sucks best for last here we go back in medieval times many executions were public the town would come out watch a hanging or two and then grab some bread and then head home they're like hey classic sunday this was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johan, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot, like a lot, a lot. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Brzezinski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you wanna do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmeted cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just 
ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They plucked a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked. Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to receive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably, and if you didn't, it was looked down on, but then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, which is like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven. A jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow, as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Brain in. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far. Off with her head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy, is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noble women, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially with, in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number five, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on B, you know, I do my best, specifically underwater footage. I know that gives us all the creeps. We love exploring the deeps for some reason, but in this next one, I couldn't believe, honestly. You're about to see footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier, so buckle up. This glacier is the size of Florida, so if it collapses at any point in our time, our sea levels could rise 10 feet. And in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet through the middle of Thwaites Glacier. Then they dropped a robot with a camera right down, and they saw this. For the first time ever, we've now seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true, and I can't agree more. It's her walking on the moon moment, and I could not agree more. This feels like another universe, almost. This looks like the upside down. This is terrifying. There's only one meter of space between the bottom of the glacier and the rocky seafloor, so think about that when you sleep tonight. Number four, message in a bottle. Back in 1959, a geologist named Paul Walker, 
no, not that one, not even close. He decided to bury a message in a bottle and he wanted to make a lasting statement about climate change. So he put this frozen message underneath rocks near a glacier in 1959 and then cut to 2013. Well, what do we find again? We find Paul Walker's message in a bottle. The message inside was measurements, and to be exact, it was the length from the exact point of the bottle to the edge of a nearby glacier. But by 2013, many, many years later, said glacier had shrunk down 200 feet, so now the glacier was much further. A lasting statement indeed, I would say. Good call, Paul Walker. Number three, Ice Age art. More ancient artwork, but this time we're going to the Colombian Amazon. Now the thing is, unlike other drawings found in the ceilings of tombs or anything like that, this frozen canvas stretches about eight miles. It's incredible. The paintings inside, they're even more impressive. Dating back to 12,000 years ago, these were made near the end of the last ice age. Thousands of paintings, by the way, not just a handful of arrows, nothing like that, just a huge canvas. These were found in 2017, so pretty recently, but it was only last year where they finally went public with these Arctic findings. Now the findings being, you know, paintings of elephants, massive of sloths, horses from the ice age, snakes, birds, deer, that kind of stuff. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Yeah, pregnant women or the origins of the Ninja Turtles? I don't know, I'm on the fence, you tell me. Number two, the Glacier Girl. Now before you get worried, no, this next one is not a real person, this next one is a plane. A P-23 aircraft was discovered in Greenland surrounded in ice. Now during World War II in July 1942, six P-38 fighter planes were ordered to make an emergency landing in Greenland due to lousy weather conditions and of course low visibility. Now the crew was thankfully saved, but the Lockheed had to be abandoned, never to be seen again for now 50 years. Recently it was dug out of 264 feet of snow and ice. It took years to get this plane back up, but now she of course is known as the Glacier Girl, and in 2017, Lewis Energy CEO Rodney Lewis, he bought this plane. Yeah, they just brought a plane out of the ice, and this guy's like, yeah, I'll buy it, debit, no problem. And finally, number one, a preserved mammoth cub. In 2010, a mummified mammoth cub was discovered in Siberia, right off the coast of Oyogos, named after a nearby village, Yuka, this newfound cub, is now the best preserved mammoth cub discovered in history. Now this was a fascinating find that should have never been seen again, let alone found in such great condition. It's kind of haunting when you look at it, it still looks alive, you know what I mean? But apparently that's not the end of woolly mammoths. Who knew? It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal, they're now planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. For reasons, you know, for science reasons. The last mammoth to walk the planet alive was around 10,500 years ago, but what if they were alive today? Colossal raised over $15 million and now they're working on reviving that woolly mammoth. They're doing this to ideally decelerate the melting of the Arctic permafrost and to save modern elephants from extinction and of course to advance CRISPR editing. We love science, maybe a little too much, I don't know. Is it a good idea to bring the woolly mammoth back to life or are we just, I don't know, setting them up for another slow, horrible demise once again? On number 10, roast hedgehog. Hedgehogs, am I right? They're cute little spiky balls of fun and they make pretty good pets too. They're so cute that you would never want anything bad to happen to them, right? Well, if you lived in the medieval ages, you might beg to differ because while today we see hedgehogs as these lovable little creatures, back then they were nothing but something to feed your family for dinner. Sorry to anyone who owns a hedgehog. Yeah, hedgehogs were a delicacy back then and there's even a record of a common recipe for them. In the olden days when someone was looking to cook up a hedgehog for dinner, you would first have to unalive it and then gut it, tie it up, and wrap it in pastry. Apparently, if your hedgehog wouldn't unroll after it was uh, taken out, so to speak, you would just have to simply boil it in water and continue the preparation process. Apparently, back then, it was believed that eating hedgehogs helped with medical conditions like throat inflammation and leprosy. Not really sure how effective that was, but it was still a thing. At number nine, porpoise pottage. During Lent, people weren't allowed to eat meat. Normally, people would substitute to do fish into their diet during this time, but if you were one of the wealthy, then you could treat yourself to something a little more extravagant than just plain old fish. For those who could afford it, they would sit down to a seafood feast, and they really ate anything that came out of the sea. We're talking fish, lobster, crabs, eels, and dolphins. Yeah, they thought that dolphins were fish and so safe to eat during Lent. 
In a recipe book from 1399 written by King Richard II's cooks, there was a recipe for porpoise fermentry, which was basically a sweet and spicy wheat porridge with dolphin on top. It consisted of almond milk and saffron and just sounds absolutely vile. I couldn't imagine what a dolphin would even taste like, but I wouldn't imagine that it would taste very good, especially with almond milk, wheat, and saffron. But would you guys try it? Now before I carry on telling you guys about the weird things that people ate in medieval times, I would first like to take a moment to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up with some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook, to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw it through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth. End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. At number seven, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful. But this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and trice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half, and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. At number six, roasted cat. We started off this list talking about one common household pet that was traditionally eaten in medieval times, but now we have another, so for anyone who has a feline friend, you might want to skip this part. Roasted cat was yet another bizarre food that was eaten back in the olden days, and I can't really say I'm all that surprised. I mean, they were eating hedgehogs, dolphins, and garbage, so I wouldn't put it past them to take a bite out of Garfield too. Roasted cat was a pretty straightforward dish. They would just marinate it and roast it like they would any other kind of animal, but what makes this dish strange, other than the fact that it's a cat, was the way that it was prepared, and the superstition behind it. Cats already have a lot of superstition behind them, so it makes sense that in medieval times they believed all sorts of things about felines, but when it came to cooking them, it was believed that cutting the head off before cooking it was a vital step because, quote, it is not for eating, for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. End quote. So yeah, don't go eating cat brains, I guess. Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return for these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious. Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as 
as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah. Take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was, gladiators had a code they had to follow, and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments, and seeing your prize fighter that you like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents, and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trap doors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade, what a show. Also, this is terrifying. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed 
two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it, I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the middle ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, uh, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. In our number five spot today, we have the gentleman of Rehi. This photo shows the gentleman of Rehi, and that is not a gentleman, and instead is the world's oldest surviving diving suit. It is an absolutely terrifying sight, but also an important pillar that allowed for this kind of technology to develop to what it 
is today. The suit date backs to the early 18th century, but it came to find its home at the Rehi Museum during the 1860s after it was donated. The suit was initially designed to allow people the ability to check the hull of ships without having to bring them into dry dock. The old gentleman is made mostly of leather with pitch thread used to stitch the seams. From here, the suit is sealed with more pitch, and then to create the waterproof coat, it is covered in a mixture of mutton tallow, tar, and pitch. Of course, underwater pressure increases dramatically, and this is why there's also wooden framework in the hood in order to keep it from collapsing under the pressure. At the top of the hood, there is an opening for a wooden air pipe. The air will be pumped to the diver, then it can be released from the suit through a pipe on the backside. Of course, this means that the suit wasn't completely watertight, so divers could only go under for a short period and couldn't dive very deep because there was only so much pressure the suit could take, but still, the suit was far better than having no suit at all. In our number four spot today, we have ectoplasm. This photo is said to have been taken in 1910, and it shows a medium in the middle of a spiritual seance. I don't know about you, but a 1910 seance sounds like an absolutely terrifying time. This photo is said to be catching the moment that ectoplasm appears out of the mouth of the medium. When we're talking about the occult and the paranormal, ectoplasm is a viscous substance that exudes from a spiritual entity, or sometimes the earthbound medium who is connected to or communicating with the spirit. It is said that this substance can take the shape of a face or a hand or a complete body, and it's usually seen in a darkened room during a sort of seance. And this is the way that the paranormal can physically manifest themselves in our world. So basically, what I'm saying is that this is supposed to be the moment that an evil entity is making themselves known in our world. Thankfully, at the end of the contact with the spirit, the ectoplasm will usually disappear as it returns to the entity, so it hopefully didn't stay around long, but this photo sure is something. In our number three spot today, we have the isolator. There are tons of strange inventions from the past. We have entire lists and videos dedicated to the strange inventions. There's so many. And while this is one that can be added to the list of bizarre inventions, it can also be added to the list of creepy ones as well. This photo shows what was meant to be a sort of anti-distraction contraption from the 1920s. Listen. I can get easily distracted, so sometimes I need a little help. But this thing really takes it to a new level. It essentially makes it impossible for the person to look at anything other than what is directly in front of them, or, you know, breathe. It seems like a contraption that requires an oxygen tank hookup probably isn't going to be the best anti-distraction device. In fact, I think that's probably more distracting than anything. Honestly, I'm such a good procrastinator that even with this thing, I still wouldn't get my work done. Thankfully, this device didn't stick around or gain much popularity, and now it is just a terrifying relic of the past. In our number two spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Khan was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish, which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental cash. In an article from December 10th, 1933 of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch's Sunday Magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish, and sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from the time of World War II, and it shows a very terrifying kind of ad. The sign reads, these men didn't take their adabrine. And at first, I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out that adabrine was actually the first synthetic form of a drug which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troops fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs in a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? 
The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as the <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people are dumping, they're doo doo at windows. Be like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale and then. Number seven, get married. Love is in the air. In the dark ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was, boom. No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that. Sex before marriage, of course, was also a no-no, so if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married, and then be like, get out, weirdo, and they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened, because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six, disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe an argument got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> one, two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, shotgun weddings. Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number four, the mystery of Ludlow Castle. 
Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marianne de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number three, secret passageways. If I am ever, ever in my life, able to actually afford a house, we'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library, like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it, because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the Postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend, and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corf Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number two, where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too, and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Number 10, we will get out of lockdown. I don't know, maybe? We'll see. I think so. I'm starting this one as number 10 because I literally cannot believe we are here. I just got my second dose and it was officially two weeks last Friday, so. Hugs are a coming, and I remember feeling even a few months ago that this would never happen. Researchers estimate that over 9.5 billion doses of the vaccine will be administered by the end of 2022. That means that for weddings, school, restaurants, libraries, work without masks is going to be in our future. With the Delta variant still at play, there is the possibility of other precautions being put in place, but still, if not by 2022, then eventually. <laughs> the vaccines can protect against it, so as long as we keep doing our part to keep each other safe. We are on the way, babies. I'm gonna hug so many people. Maybe even you, or you, or you, Chris. Number nine, the Sagrada Familia. One of the largest and longest construction projects will finally come to an end. Antonio Gaudi's masterpiece began construction in 1882 and has had nine, nine architects take over since. It is called the Sagrada Familia Church and is located in Barcelona, Spain, or Barcelona, as they say in Vicky Christine Barcelona. I love that. Barcelona? 
Ba -da -da. Jordi Folly and his team will be the last people to ever work on it. The pure extravagance and luxury of this building is overwhelmingly breathtaking, but why on earth has it taken so long? Well, the original architect died in 1926, there was the Spanish Civil War, the original project was destroyed, and lack of funding. The majority of the project was privately funded and subsidized. The designs that Gaudi laid down are also incredibly complex, with each layer and brick containing intricate details. He wanted to build the highest church in the world and that it will be with the central Jesus Tower reaching 172.5 meters. But finally after 150 years of construction the church will finally be complete in 2026. If everything goes well. You never know. As we found out in the last two years. You just never know. Number 8. The Triple Jovian Eclipse. Some really cool things have already happened these past few months and there is plenty more to come so don't you worry. The next Jovian Eclipse is set to happen in 2032. What is that you ask? Well, three of Jupiter's largest moons, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto will align across the planet's surface like a couple of cool space polka dots. Yeah, we'll call them that. Jupiter has 16 moons in total and the three mentioned are among the biggest in its orbit. The last time this happened was in 2004 and was caught on the Hubble Space Telescope by some miracle. The event happens so quickly and this time scientists are hoping to capture the event in sharp detail so stay tuned. Watch your google. Number 7. We might, we might live forever? I don't know. Put down the Botox and hold the collagen injections, there might be another way. Thanks to the SENS Research Foundation, we may find a way to turn back the clock when it comes to aging. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is an English author, biomedical gerontologist, and mathematician who believes that one day, one day, aging might be stopped by medical intervention. His research involves attempting to find a way to treat the disease of aging by repairing damage on a molecular level. One of the main causes of aging are dead cells or senescent cells. Once the cell stops multiplying, they release a whole stew of chemicals that cause inflammation and the breakdown of surrounding tissue. Now usually our body fights these off because they are recognized as imposters and they are forced to self-destruct but they accumulate with age. If they are successful at finding a way to diminish these cells, it could mean that they could make a 60 year old feel and look 30 again. Pretty exciting stuff. Not without controversy though. MIT Tech Review challenged molecular biologists to disprove Gray's claims for a chance to win 20 grand, but nobody has yet. So... Number 6. NASA's New Horizons Spacecraft Humanity is pretty freaking astounding and our reach is stretching further and further out into the universe every day. Right now, the Voyager 1 and 2 are currently exploring interstellar space, but NASA just launched yet another incredibly exciting space adventure. NASA's New Horizons Spacecraft is currently out in space at a distance of 50 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. Scientists estimate that by the 2040s, it will finally surpass Voyager 1 and 2 in interstellar space and who knows what it will find. New Horizon gets its power source from a single radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is super cool how it works. Essentially a kind of nuclear battery that sources its power through the natural radioactive decay of plutonium dioxide fuel. What? I'm not a scientist, so that blew my mind. I'm not quite sure if I understand it. Do we understand it? Let us know in the comments. The decay rate is high enough to create a reliable amount of heat so the engine can just keep going and going and going. So it just opens up a future of discoveries and I'm excited. I'm excited. At number five, beavers. Remember a little while ago when I mentioned the medieval practices of Lent and how they ate dolphins because they thought they were fish? Well, we have another animal that is most definitely not a fish, but medieval people believed that it was. Beavers. Yeah, beavers. They thought that because beavers were such good swimmers that they just had to be some kind of fish and were therefore suitable to eat during Lent. Originally, it was just the tail of the beaver that was suitable for Lent because it was considered cold, but later on they figured that the whole animal was good to eat because again, they thought it was a fish. I can't really see how they looked at this furry animal and thought to themselves, ah yes, a fine sea dwelling fish. But hey, these people believed in witches, unicorns, and regularly put animals like pigs and donkeys on trial, so there you go. At number four, 
singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. At number three, roasted swan. A lot of people see swans as beautiful creatures. I mean, I see them as deceptive geese because even though they are pretty, they will still attack you and eat your young, but I digress. Though swans are a lot of people's favorite animals, in medieval times, swans were more so people's favorite food. Yeah, even the swans weren't safe from being devoured. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, since it's a bird, it's probably prepared in a normal way. And to those people, I say, have you been paying attention at all? Nothing was normal back then, and of course they had to make things weird. There were two ways of preparing a swan. The weird way, and the strange way. The first way of preparing the swan was to mince the entrails of a boiled swan with bread, ginger, and blood, and then mix it with vinegar. Yum. And the second way was to cut the bird open, remove its skin, roast it on a spit, and then reclothe it with its skin and feathers, and present it to eager guests. Sounds absolutely horrible. At number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny, sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp tooth worm of the sea. And finally at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cock and trices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when it got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs in a pie, and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. Now how's that for dinner and a show? Before I wrap things up for today though, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me out of all the foods that I talked about today, what is one food that you would try and one food that you would avoid at all costs? Yeah.